Welcome to the show. We are your hosts, David Andrew B. Band. Anime Alexander. Welcome to episode 41 of DawCast Music Entrepreneurship. I'm back! And Anna is finally back. Sorry, man. I'm, I'm such a terrible co host. I've been MIA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I've kept things going. I still put out regular episodes. I think there's a few weeks there that I missed, but I still do some solo stuff and I still do some interview stuff, so. Which is still good. I mean, I've been busy, you know, I got engaged and stuff. That's pretty huge. <laughs> I moved again. Okay, now you're making me look lazy. No. <laughs> <laughs> I got engaged in stuff. I just have to point that out twice. Can we put like a picture up on the... I'm, I'm sorry, I won't do that. Um, Maybe actually, we should. <laughs> what I did put up on the Facebook page, and I think everybody should look at it, is uh, my mother is an incredible quilter. Um, if you ask her, though, she does not agree with me. Um, but if you look on the Facebook page, there is a heavy metal stocking that I posted and that my mother made that David can actually look at on the wall right now. I did look at it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> don't look too closely. You'll notice the musical inaccuracies and we just won't tell my mom because <laughs> I love her. And I think it's awesome that she just tried to do something that's kind of out of her comfort zone and, and went and did it anyways. But um, I think it's pretty rad and it's got a big S on it for Stefan. Um, who's my man mm -hmm. <laughs> and I'm his girl. And it's got like, if you look really closely at the photo, there are ax notes on it because yeah. Metal. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, you can't see me right now. <laughs> no, nobody can see your hand. They are. <laughs> I'm not that good at that, but Le I just tried. <laughs> at least until we do the video episode. But yeah. Yes, I have been directing more people to our Facebook page because it was recently rebranded. Re have you looked at it? Yes, I have. Yes. Hey, man, I posted on it. So there you go. Yeah. You got to keep posting on it so we can keep engaging our people. user base. I'm really terrible. I mean, I mean, you know, I try this social media thing. I'm really, really awful. And uh, my fiance is quite good at it. And you're quite good at it. And everybody around me is quite good at it. And then my Twitter, I get on it like periodically <laughs> it's kind of sad time is the biggest issue at least for me it is an issue and i mean you know i should be posting what i'm up to um recently did a huge body image project with some women in the city uh working on sound and music stuff that should go up there yeah <laughs> the hills are alive um trying to solve maria she's quite the problem um not typically a musical gal, but uh, I'm having a good time meeting some really interesting people, someone I'd like to bring on the podcast to interview. Yeah, we're definitely looking forward to doing more interviews and hopefully yes. some locally. And he's actually offered to let us use his studio for that podcast. Is that right? Mm -hmm. That might be a little different, hey? Film and uh, sound recording, they, they do there, and uh, a venue that you can record an album might be a nice thing to check out for local musicians, would be a great one for us to do some filming at. Oh, yeah. So, if they have, they might even have broadcast quality microphones. That, Probably. That would make us sound pretty flippin' amazing. Hey, I am pretty flippin' amazing. Have you not heard my voice? <laughs> Uh, I wouldn't uh, brag too much about the last few shows. It's partly my fault, I'll, I'll admit that. But I'm making a big, ridiculous frowny face. <laughs> Actually, I have to say this. I don't use the term frowny face, but um, I fell down some concrete stairs, uh. icy concrete stairs leaving rehearsal. And I don't know what it is about certain men feeling they need to use certain terms with women but uh the one massage therapist is working on my neck and it's giving me this ridiculous is that coming through the i think it is it's okay okay <laughs> <laughs> sorry um if you can hear that uh, my fiance is obsessed with a uh, uh, Edgar Allan Poe, uh, the Raven uh, song being sung by Omnia, and he's listening to it, and that is the song you can hear in the background right now. Or maybe you can't. We're not. Maybe sure you yet. can't. Um, anyways, long story short, I'm sitting there frowning because I'm getting a, a migraine, and he's like, "Oh, you're making a frowny face." <laughs> I'm an adult. <laughs> yeah. You just go, "Hey, does that hurt?" <laughs> <laughs> Just a little weird. Yeah, don't tough talk baby talk me. Don't baby talk me, man. <laughs> I mean, here for some therapy. Let me just cuss it out. <laughs> That's pretty funny. <laughs> I think anybody would be cussing it out with some of the stuff they've been doing to me lately. Well, it's no good to be hurt. I actually recently slipped on some ice. 
So that was kind of random and unexpected. Mm -hmm. And because we keep freezing and thawing and freezing and thawing、oh. and so much snow in Calgary that doesn't get cleared, especially in my neighborhood, where it seems to snow at least six inches more than anywhere else. Have you been to Mackenzie Town lately? There you go. <laughs> That's so, so but yeah. Fortunately, I was not really hurt in the process, but I, I did end up hitting my elbow, my back. Ooh. Which could be much worse if had the fall been a little different. So, yeah, I quite badly injured my back and my knee, and so I'm in therapy every day. I'm not in rehearsal right now, so it's part of the reason I've been so busy. And it was a freeze thaw thing. I mean, we'd had we'd been up over 10 degrees that day, and、mm -hmm. in three four hour span, I was inside doing rehearsal. I just iced, and you know, people are going, "Oh, are you gonna sue? Really? I'm not gonna win that." <laughs> No. So. How long do you expect to be in therapy? Ah,、uh, they're saying minimum three months. Three months. Yeah. How far do you have to go? Ah,、uh, probably three months. I'm still swollen in my back and my knee. So, please, people, go out buy yourself some yak tracks. They are amazing、um, on the ice. And、uh, watch your step. And a、uh, little-known fact: they're posting on the Weather Network. Beet juice is a great de-icer. Works at much cooler temperatures than、uh, salt. Interesting. And that is your geek moment for today. <laughs> <laughs> If you have any questions or comments regarding this podcast, send an email to comments at daw-music.com. So, what have we got next on the agenda? We would like to talk about music entrepreneurship because、Excellent. it is. Almost kind of the elephant in the room. I think I've talked about it a little bit here and there,、mm -hmm. and I've tried to define it. It doesn't necessarily have a definition. The reason is because, in a way, I am kind of the the perpetrator of that keyword of music entrepreneurship.、Mm -hmm. I I have actually seen it pop up more on the internet now, so I don't know if that's due to me or I'm just finding things. Oh, you're、now. just taking credit for everything now, Dave. <laughs> For all the trends, yeah. <laughs> all the trends. This guy right put, here. Put it, put it. Yeah, maybe not. But I think it it's actually going to become a necessity as we look forward to the information age and and what's going to happen. Because、mm -hmm. uh, we are really kind of full blown in the information age, kind of have been for a few years now. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. I don't. I'm not overwhelmed at all. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's really news to anybody. So, with music sort of becoming, you know, a more and more a saturated market, even if it's just because more hobbyists are putting up on iTunes or more,、mm -hmm. more aspiring musicians are are coming up and then putting their releases, really that number is only going to increase. And you know, if I I don't know if iTunes will continue to be the main platform for for downloading music or not, but that. Number is just going to keep jumping and going higher. So、mm -hmm. there's quite a bit of saturation. How、yeah. do you stand out in the crowd? Exactly. So I think that's where, if you are able to approach music with an entrepreneurial mindset, you can begin to problem solve and find ways of making money that may not be totally traditional. But we've talked about, you know, look at other industries that could require music. Yeah, even alternative venues. We've、It、talked is about is a way. Yeah, alternative venues. You know, every time I go for a massage or end up at a spa for whatever reason,、um, you know, doing girly things, <laughs> I have to wonder because. I know that the music that they're playing in most spas is licensed. They、yeah. actually have to pay for this. Yeah. Whoever is making spa money or spa music is making a killing. Mm -hmm. Like they must be in royalties. You have to be,、um, you know. Go out and figure it out.、Um, there's a lot of people that need music for a lot of different things. A lot of companies are making corporate videos.、Mm -hmm. Get yourself hooked、oh, yeah. up with somebody who's doing corporate videos. Do their music for them. It's a cool idea. Yeah. Why not? I think there's opportunity for everything. I think even Dan talked about that way back in like episode eleven or so.、Mm -hmm. He just said, "Hey, you know, I, I hear that you're doing、uh, this event. Could you use some music?" And so there's always opportunity to、oh, kind、yeah. of ask. You know, don't stick your nose into everything. That's no, no, not what we're talking about.、But. Um, and you know, I'm even noticing working downtown is、uh, new for me. The street performing 
is very different downtown, especially in the lunch hour and the plus 15s. Hmm. You know, you've why not bring out a four piece band with a stand up bass, a washboard, a violin, and a guitar and four part harmony? Mm-hmm. Why not? Um, you know, what does it need to be a guy standing there with a guitar? Why not uh, also be simultaneously broadcast on the radio while you're playing your violin? Uh, Eileen. Uh, Kosaya, I'm not good at last names. Oh, yeah. Pardon me. Uh, saw her doing that one day. Really? And uh, while she was playing, she was also broadcasting on, on the local university station. There you, know, you go. Why not do That's that? That's great. It's kind of neat and it's different. Why not bring your whole band out to the plus 15 and play on your lunch hour? And it is, the one band is like, you know, the one person comes out on their lunch hour, the, the fourth third and fourth position in this band kind of alternate depending on when you're on the plus 15 because of people's lunch hours. Why not do that? Why not bring out beautiful four-part harmony? It is kind of funny watching the people on their cell phones, you know, shuffling down the hallway as quickly as they can to avoid the musicians. Yeah. But for the most part, people are happy and these people are making money. Way better than the the solo dude with the guitar just kind of standing there looking depressed. Of course. You know. I think the other point that you've kind of raised there is a lot of musicians miss the nine to five opportunities because Mm -hmm. they have to be engaged in a job. And that's where I think entrepreneurship might provide an opportunity to streamline your lifestyle, Mm -hmm. make a little bit of money, not not a ton of money, because you can actually live on a little bit if you do it right. Maybe work a little less Mm -hmm. or even just work less and get paid more for working less, which is also possible. Mm hmm. It's a tough industry right now. I mean, I I agree with what you're saying, but I also think a lot of things are becoming devalued in our culture. Yeah. You know, um, labor work has been devalued, so we outsource, or people don't want to take it, so we're having to bring in uh, laborers from other countries who are willing to work for less. Um, Teachers are being devalued and are put on one- and two-year contracts. Mm. Um, Doctors, in some cases, are being devalued. Lawyers. Um, it's becoming harder and harder to get jobs for lawyers, uh, PhDs who are teaching at universities. And it's not just music. I'd say music is oh, one. Yeah. And, and you can sit and go, oh, you know, I can see the one side of it where everybody's like, oh, you didn't get a practical degree. But on the same side of it, people who do did go in and get practical degrees are also having difficulties. You know, it's really sick to see bands in Calgary, going out, even some of the better known bands, earning a tenth of what bands were earning in the 80s. Yeah. And people are arguing with me on it, going, oh, do what you that love. That never happened. That doesn't happen. You know, I've got somebody <laughs> who argued with me on Facebook about this a couple days ago, and I just want to go up and smack them in the face. <laughs> yeah, you're happy doing your IT job, and good for you. That's incredibly That's rare right now in in our economy because people are devaluing people are really devaluing even the it field can you fix my uh, laptop for free you know how much do you hear that and part of that is you've got to put your foot down and and you know uh but people used to help each other out outside of work hours with their friends it's telling when we have musicians in the Philharmonic sleeping on people's couches and you can say oh it was uh, really poor uh, care on, on on the board of directors 10 years ago or whatever but the the truth is is people are not getting the full-time tenured positions that they used to bars are not paying what they used to so we're yep. having to go look for opportunities and iTunes is a double-edged sword you know, yeah. being able to get music for 99 cents a song or, you know, albums for four bucks. I just picked up an album for four bucks. You know, it's nice for us, but it's also when you go into certain venues, I think people are like, oh, yeah, I'll give you guys 100 bucks to come play for the night. That's a joke. Um, we would never play for that. Yeah. But there are people desperate to be heard, so they'll play for it. And that's why people are getting away with it. That's why we've got venues, well-known venues. We're not naming names because I don't want anybody getting angry with me. Well-known music venues in this city that take in a ton of money on a Thursday night are charging musicians 150 for the privilege of performing on the stage. In the 80s, when bands were actually getting paid, when the musicians union was able to stick their neck out for people, 
and, and the environment isn't really conducive to that currently. I don't know an easy solution. I'm not saying I have yeah. a solution. But in the 80s, yeah, a band could walk up with all their gear. They could bring their own speakers. They could bring their own sound guy, their own light guy, and pay everybody because they were taking in 10 grand a night. Right. You know, we'd be lucky. You're lucky to get a gig that pays a grand and food. <laughs> And this, the interesting part of what you're saying, and I thought about this the other night too, which is, would you ever really go to some of those venues on 17th that are rock or cover band oriented? More often than not, you and I find ourselves in coffee houses, in smaller venues. Which, is, which has some great, fantastic music that needs to be heard. And, and would you direct anybody to go to like some of those bars you on know, 17th? I'm not even talking a bar on 17th. I'm talking a major folk venue in the city. Well, I know. That we've played at. So that's why I'm also keeping my mouth shut. I, I, and we weren't charged because I think one of the other... Oh. Well, did we only do open mics there, I think? Probably. Um... Maybe, but, you know, usually from what I've heard of people doing shows at that particular venue, the lower act is the one paying and the headliner's not paying to perform. Well, how is that okay? It's how not. is door okay? Door is a joke. I'm sorry. I honestly feel that a lot of, of the arts are being undervalued because of the internet. I'm not seeing... And at the same time, there's some people finding some really cool niches, like graphics. Yeah. You know, there's people... You were telling me about a site where you can go on and, and bid f for design, or people can, you know, undercut each other to work totally. for you. Okay, so now we've devalued art, right? Well, now I'm finding... In, in terms of wanting to get, pardon me, married. Um, there's people who sell graphic art on um, Etsy. Yep. Etsy is an art site. And they'll uh, post a template for their wedding invitations. Oh, I've got a Paradise theme. Oh, I've got a Spanish theme. Oh, I've got an Art Deco Great Gatsby theme. You know, pe Peacock theme, Rose theme, whatever you want. And then they just slip your information in there and go. That's their yeah. their shtick. The template. They make excellent money. You know, they spend all the time building their template, get their name out. I don't know an easy answer for us to be able to do that with music, right? Yeah. So it's looking outside the box. Here's another cool opportunity I've noticed. Brookfield Properties downtown, if you're on the elevator, it advertises they're looking for artists of all shapes and sizes because it enriches their space. Would you and I think to call up an office tower and go, hey, can we uh, perform in your lobby? No. <laughs> <laughs> but there are Progressively, office yes, towers but... looking for this and paying for this because it enriches their space and makes people want to be there and buy things from their tenants and hang out. And it's good for them. And so... You know, there are some good opportunities, but at the same time, a lot of people are, are looking at musicians and other artists, you know, web designers um, and going, oh, yeah, you can you can play my wedding for a hundred bucks. Right. Right. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I know a classical musician who will do your ceremony only for 250 and that includes like three songs total when you stop and think about it there's really not music playing the whole ceremony yeah so that's not a bad rate for her right but for the most part <laughs> you know i wouldn't play a wedding for bucks you yeah. know you're talking hours of entertainment in the evening you probably have to play covers which not everybody likes doing if you're asked to play two songs during a ceremony that might be a fair rate depending on how much work you have to put into preparing. yeah um for her you know but for a whole night of entertainment no not happening and i think the everything is free on the internet thing has kind of skewed people's perception of of value and value in not just our industry and we need to keep that in mind it's tough for musicians we're not the only ones having a hard time yeah. we're not the only ones being outsourced yeah, the tricky part in what you're saying, too, is it's really all forms of digital media now. Because mm -hmm. you can go onto a site at like Fiverr.com, and we were looking at that earlier today. And people are offering services that you, they obviously, if they took them an hour to do, uh, they would be losing money because nobody can live on $5 an hour. It's the kind of things they can do in 10 minutes, 20 minutes or less. Yeah. But you can outsource just about anything you want. I mean... They, they determine what, what it is they're offering 
if you go to like uh, if you go to fiverr.com but i was looking at some of the things and i was going man if i became a middleman to some of this stuff there's no much there's no telling how much upselling could be done Mm -hmm. and not saying that's my prerogative but that is like an entrepreneurial sort of uh, you know look at how those things work so oh yeah I'm just saying it's a different climate it is. and we need to look at things a little differently. Where is the money in your industry? Okay, so the money in graphic design is not necessarily working out of a local print shop. Yeah. You know, if you get a really That's particularly an hourly wage. Yeah, if you get a particularly good print shop, you can get a very nice hourly wage. I can direct you to a couple print shops where you can get a fantastic job, you better come in with a ton of experience and an amazing knock your socks off portfolio. Yeah. That's not gonna happen if you're starting out. Now, if you go on Etsy and start selling, you know, <laughs> you've got a line of print your own party hats because it's the new vogue to have ridiculous children's parties, and it really is. Uh, people trying to outdo each other. Go ahead and do your party hats and, and make some money off people. Yeah. It's a good way to get some experience and get going and coming up with a way of doing it. Look at other venues is what I'm saying. It's, it's yeah. the look at uh, doing music for movies. Look at doing music for video games or spas or whatever. There's a lot of money in that. For if sure. you are willing to do something a little different than what you normally do. Absolutely. Try it. And you're still doing something pretty damn incredible. If you think about some of the music that's been in video games and music in the last decade. Oh, yeah. It's mind-blowing how incredible the music is. It is amazing. Why not do it? You're not really selling out unless you suddenly are playing a whole other genre than you like playing. I, and, and that could be considered selling out or not. Look at it a different way, I guess is what I'm saying. Yeah. That dovetails nicely into what I was wanting to say about having a value proposition, because mm-hmm. I think what you've identified there with a lot of the music venues not really valuing the va- the proposition that musicians often come in with uh, to, to play a gig is that I think we, we just have to acknowledge, unfortunately, that the, those days of getting paid a, a buttload of money are over. So it's I think it's quickly becoming, our, as much as that kind of sucks sort of turning it around and saying how do we bring something of value to the venue Mm -hmm. so that we are accepted and that uh, maybe later there will be some form of monetary transactions taking place that that will benefit you so doing giving value up front uh, not necessarily expecting anything in return and you do need to be careful with that. You do. You, you can't just let people take advantage of you. And there, yeah. there are going to be venues that will offer you money. So that's not what I'm saying. Yeah. But I think we, we sort of have to uh, just approach it from a different angle. Like you and I, uh, what we did with, with the band once upon a time was have a few different bands performing with us. So our value proposition was we're going to bring three acts and yeah. we're going to bring our own door person. It was not a huge thing, but it but the little things count. And we sent them a thank you note, and we made sure that we treated every people loved well. Th- yeah, the venues loved that. Uh, if I was booking in at a venue, um, there's one particular venue in town where they'll book three different acts themselves. Yeah. Each Friday or Saturday, what night was it we'd play? Um, but it's tedious. And it's tedious for them to try to find three bands that kind of fit together. We turn around and do it all for them. And they're, yeah. you know, the thing I heard each time we were picking up tickets was you were the easiest band in the city to work with. Exactly. So there, there's our value. And, okay, we didn't walk away with a lot of money. I think, uh, you know, yourself, Patrick, and I all walked away with 100 150 bucks each. And the other bands got paid a little. But those guys call us back later and go, hey, you want to play a gig? So there you go. Uh, And then they recommended us to other bars. And that's not to pat ourselves on the back or brag. But that should give you an idea or should give our listeners an idea as far as what to think about for for creating some kind of value proposition. And also in in creating value proposition, and it's something that, you know, comes across, uh, what's his name, David... um, we interviewed him. David Hooper? No. Is it David Hooper? Oh, God. He does the music marketing website. Um, There's so many. Oh, David Chick? CD Baby. Uh, Derek Severs. Derek Severs. <laughs> oh, God, help me. I'm so sorry, Derek. Um, 
talks about is uh, cultivating relationships. Yeah, yeah. And really, all we're doing, we're not really doing anything particularly overly valuable. No, that's exactly what I'm saying. I don't think in doing what we were doing with that, where I was finding other bands, we were cultivating relationships. We were going up to other bands and going, hey, uh, you want a gig? (laughs) Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I want a gig. And then we're going to the bars and cultivating a relationship with them. It's important. And was it Derek Sivers or someone else who was talking about a, a female musician who'd go to festivals and take notes of everybody she yeah, worked with? That was Sivers. And everybody liked working with this gal because she was such a great networker and so good at uh, making people feel valued. You really can't discount. It's the whole careful who you step on on the way up the ladder because, yeah. you know. In fact, don't even look at it as a ladder. <laughs> it's not a ladder, no. But it's that analogy that you hear from people from time to time. You know, if you're rude and disrespectful on your way to success, you are not going to be successful for long. Yeah. Or your life is going to really suck. Um, <laughs> maybe talking about Justin Bieber right now. <laughs> Yeah. Oh my goodness. Not even worth a read on some of the stuff I saw. I didn't really read anything. I kind of knew what happened. Oh my God, he went to jail for being stupid. Other things I've seen from him had me thinking that this was a matter of time. Uh, Recently in Australia, he was caught telling a girl she was too fat to be out by the pool. What? Yeah. Yeah. You know, a girl who's about a size 12, according to onlookers. Okay, then. You know, unfortunately, if you're going to be rude, everybody's going to talk about it. You know, very few people talk about the nice guy who went out and did something cool. If you do it enough. If you do it enough. Who is it? Jack Black, I want to say. Put money into the... uh, Freemason Theater. Uh, It's owned by the Freemasons. Something like that in Chicago, I want to say, or Detroit. Detroit that he put money into. Goodness, I'm so bad with details. Let me Um, see if I can find that. Anyway, he heard the venue was going to shut down because they'd run out of money. It's one of these cities that was really hit by the auto manufacturing downturn. And I guess grew up with his mother working as an usher there. Jack White, I think. Jack White. Oh, Jack Black is uh, wrong field. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I came up with something else about Jack Black, and that says, uh, is Jack Black Illuminati? <laughs> so is he part well, of the secret society? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Which really? is interesting. But. Yeah, sorry. Now I'm visualizing Jack Black in my head. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, it, he also did that anonymously. So when... Yeah. Other people started reporting it. People talked about it. And yeah, it's really cool. Somebody gave a whole bunch of their own money to take care of a theater and and take care of a a performing venue. But that didn't get nearly the airplay that Justin Bieber's getting. Yeah. Or Miley Cyrus showing off all of her body. Or Lindsay Lohan or any of these people. Well, where is Lindsay Lohan? Haven't heard about her in um, quite a while. Freaking Paris Hilton getting or her. Haven't hundred, heard about her. Apparently, she's earning a hundred grand a night as a DJ now. <laughs> Whatever works, I guess. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> but part of what you're saying. But part of that is, you know, a hundred people are going to mention it if you do bad, whereas if you do yeah. good, it's not mentioned as much. But it is going to lead to your success, I think. Little by little. It's, it's always building a little bit at a time. And you're absolutely right. What we did was such a small thing. But compare that. There's a huge gap between that and a musician that shows up late, showboats, hogs the stage, mm-hmm. shows up inebriated, it's not ready, not prepared to right. perform. And some, peop- some musicians feel they can just pull it off and it sounds great to everybody, which it does not. Mm-hmm. Uh, so... There's a huge gap between those two extremes and, you know, which side do you want to be on? Because if if you're going to show up late and you're not professional, why would you expect to be paid? Extend a hand out to other people and they'll extend a hand back eventually. Yeah, it's a really good point. And then 
sort of having a live performance checklist. That was a lesson that I learned that I think is a really good idea for everybody to have. If you don't have one, go on to go, even just stop the podcast, go and create a Google Doc now. Start creating a a live performance checklist. Bring capos. Yeah. <laughs> I am the singer in our band. <laughs> and I tell the boys to bring capos. Batteries. If you need batteries, friggin' bring batteries. I have nothing kind to say about this. Bring extra power adapters. Bring extension cords. Bring yeah. spare mic cables. Bring spare microphones. If you do not, and you are in a band with me, and you do not have spare gear for yourself, I may strangle you with your busted <laughs> mic cord. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> if you need to, if you need to tape that list to your guitar or whatever, that <laughs> yeah. might be a good idea too. Because only because you may forget to mention that you have a merch special over at the table. Yeah. And you need to let them know that hey, we have T-shirts on sale tonight. Uh, you may forget to tell people about your website, which you should be directing people to, so yes, they can yeah. check out what you're doing or what show you're playing next. So there's a lot of variety of little things that I would often forget or taking a photo of the audience. That's another good. If you are in a band and you do not bring your checklist and you're in the same band as me, I will staple it to your forehead. (laughs) And that could hurt a lot. (laughs) I just, I sound like an awful person right now, but I don't care. (laughs) Another good checklist to create is a concert marketing checklist. Mm -hmm. And this is a lot more it's a lot broader and there's a lot more to do that's the hard part but making a making a list yes. of like okay i need to make sure I cover the bases on facebook twitter google plus pinterest bring some cds bring, bring some yeah um we call them handbills in theater um bring some little cards or something posters flyers posters flyers like little things that people can pop in the back of their wallet. You know, I'm, I'm going to mention some marketing from some theatrical shows and uh, don't judge, but <laughs> it won't. worked. Uh, with Fringe, uh, sometimes weird things work. We, we talked oh, about... Oh, yeah. Guerrilla did we, marketing. Did we talk about the phone whore with... Uh, she's a... We didn't much. We didn't talk about the phone whore. She is the best on the North American Fringe circuit right now. The best... Uh, marketer as far as fringe festival she has an umbrella that says phone whore she walks around in her cowboy boots a petticoat and fishnets and sells herself yeah and yeah the title is is catching but she gets out there she's highly visible she has something for your hand that you can throw in your wallet some other great marketing that i've heard of on the the theater circuit uh vijay monologues uh branded with stickers little labels you can get at, at staples um little stickers that said vijay monologues stuck them on tampons put them in women's washrooms put free baskets of tampons in bars and stuff and had a ton of people out at their show because it was so clever and unique. Yeah. Another one that I heard about was cocktails. It's uh, it's like vagina monologues for men. So you too can feel all supported and <laughs> loved. Empowered. And, and empowered and not like your, your naughty bits or your naughty bits because they're not naughty. Um, I believe they did condoms with a similar thing. Right. In men's rooms. Um, and, and not to like... You know, not everything is salacious. Those happen to be very fitting branding things. But if there's something little you can put in people's hands, I know guitar picks are really popular with a lot of musicians. Totally. Um, as a fan, I don't know if I'd want a guitar pick unless I play guitar. Mm-hmm. But if you've got something little that somebody might use, this is why matchbooks were so popular for so long. If you've got something, you know, when people smoked, we don't smoke so much anymore. That's not cool. But uh, I didn't smoke ever, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Me neither. I was more afraid of my voice teacher than God at that point in my life. <laughs> you know, the whole burning in hell thing will happen later. My voice teacher might murder me today, so <laughs> I'm not going to smoke. Yeah. And I'm grateful to her for that. Um, she's an amazing lady. Um, 
But if you've got something little that people are going to use that you can think of to put in their hands, you don't need to go to a marketing company and get it properly branded. An Avery label will work in a case like that. Yeah. And there's an excellent book, and it's actually called Guerrilla Marketing, and anybody who markets should pick up that yeah. book. Guerrilla Marketing, it's third or fourth edition now. In pick fact, it up and give it a read. In fact, as a musician, just read everything that says anything about guerrilla marketing. Yeah, I mean, I don't know. You don't have to use all of it. You don't have to use all of it, but there's got to be something that sets you apart. Yeah. You know, I've seen a guy walking around with a Dora the Explorer um, uh, little suitcase, and that's his uh, show bag, you know? Yep. And people go, oh, there's a guy with Dora the Explorer, and he uses it to have a conversation. That was kind of like me and my my Lakers bag from from their glory days. <laughs> I always carry my pedals in it. Is that why you have a Lakers bag? I, maybe it is. Who knows? But I guess it became a trademark, just you like know, my glasses. But also the professionalism with the with the yeah with the list, and it's something that we had somebody was considering. We were considering entering a, a management relationship with, who mentioned you know roll up in a nice white rental van with your your poop in a group. Look professional. Look professional. Dress nice. Show up nice. on time. Show up on time. Show up early. Yeah. You know, if you can show up early and the bar's not worried about you sound checking while everybody's in the room, you know, don't show up so early that they want to smack you in the teeth because you're, yeah. you're interrupting their day. But show up early, you know, look clean, take a shower, you know, before you show up. <laughs> Even if you're grunge, totally. <laughs> make sure you're you're clean. Um, have everything together, things rolled out of bins in a respectable manner. You yeah. know, keep keep from making too much of a mess, and you'll create a really big impression on people and give them a thank you note. It's true. It's so easy for us to pass around a note that says thank you. I, I'm I'm the gal in the group, so I'm kind of like the mom, and I kind of... I think it's smart. Take that nurture role, and I, I write the actual message, and you guys just pop your signature on, and we're good to go. But, yeah. you know, people remember that. They absolutely do. Any gig. I don't care if you're playing a Safeway or Sobeys or whatever grocery store. And I know people who've done it. If you're playing a Safeway... Give the manager a thank you note. Like, be nice. You know, yeah. they're giving your, they're paying you. Just say thank you. Absolutely. I think that'll go a long way in the long run. And that's a huge part of marketing, believe it or not. I'm working at a I agree. fairly large law firm now, so I'm getting to watch what a marketing department does. A lot of what they do is sending out thank you notes. Yeah. It's not. You know, we do gifts. We do, you know, the here's the golf balls with our logo on it. Here's the T-shirt, you know, blah, blah, blah. Thank you notes we send out more than anything else. Which a huge part of it is staying in people's uh, top of mind in their consciousness. Yeah, but also showing that you're grateful. Yeah. Yeah, it has to be genuine. If I get a note from someone saying thank you so much for it's and it's generic and it's not really personal. Yeah. I could still care less, even though I know that they took an effort to do that and they spent the money yeah. to buy the material. I still don't care. But if it's a personal message addressing, yeah, exactly. that's where. And that's a lot of what marketing is. Yeah. You know, there is getting yourself in someone's mind, but then there's also creating a positive impression. Yeah. I remember learning in customer service, they said on average, if somebody has a bad time at a company, they'll tell 14 people. I tell more than that, and I would say it's even worse with the internet, but if they've had a good time, they'll tell two or three. Yeah. You know, I'm being sure, I, I love using Yelp. There's a social media I actually use. I'm sure to get on Yelp and go, you know what? I went to a company, I have celiac disease, I ate, they changed their gloves and the guy preparing my food, even though there was 15 people in line behind me, didn't touch anybody else's food, so he didn't make me sick. I'm going to get out and post that because I do yeah. know how easy it is to have so much negative on the internet, but I'll also get on there and say, hey, I went to this salon and they didn't tell me that the entrance was on a different floor than the front of the, their salon in the mall. I had this happen last week. Just so you know, you need to go upstairs if you have a 9 o'clock appointment because downstairs doesn't open till 9.30 and you're now late for your appointment and can't have your service. I'll let you know. But then I'll also let you know if the service was good. And we've done our fair share of consumer reports, so people oh, know have. all about that. <laughs> yeah. 
And and that particular company found out. They said, I'm so sorry. The gal in charge of taking care of me squeezed me in anyways. Did a great job. I still posted about that. So Cool. Just a note. If you're going there, it's on my Yelp. Check my Yelp out. Check everybody's Yelp. Yelp is a great tool. Absolutely. I like it. So those would just be some ideas with live music. but mm-hmm. And there's so much more we could get into. But I think that kind of gives a broader stroke to what music entrepreneurship is about. Yeah, it's interesting. I would say a great... Hmm. Getting a job like doing a, a video game or a film is a really big payday. But I would almost... It requires almost, focus, too. But. It requires a lot of focus. And... You know, say you end up doing a film. A film can take up to seven years to from beginning Easy. to end. Easy. Uh, some up to 14, but it's on average two to seven years. I'm learning so much. <laughs> on average, two to seven years. Yeah. Video games, you can work on a video game. That, uh, I've learned this, done this. Video game can get shelved. You can't even tell anybody what company you worked for. It worked on a video game, guys. I can tell you that. But it's been shelved, and they may pull it off the shelf and continue developing it, or they may cancel it. I can't even tell you what company it was. Right. Because it's a competitive industry. But I got good money for it. Um, so it's a different thing. But live music seems to be a great way to make a good chunk of change in one go. Because word of mark- mouth marketing is still the most you yeah, know, useful and it is. way. Um, you know, selling a CD or an album, you're going to make more money over time, probably. Yeah. So I guess it's, what's your game plan? What's your end plan? And it, it should be long-term. It should be long-term, but you also need short-term money to get you through the long-term, too. Yeah. So a mixed approach is good, but think outside the box. Exactly. Even if you're street performing. And, you know, this is this is Calgary. This isn't even that great of a city to be in for street performing. It's so heavily or regulated. music in, in general. <laughs> or music in general. I would love to spend some serious time in New York, like, with a regular job, so I could see how people catch your attention to street perform there. You know what? If you're listening to us and you're in New York or one of these cities, and I've been in a couple other cities with better street performers, please tell us about it. Tell us what yeah. you saw. Tell us what things that other people could learn from these musicians. Absolutely. Leave a comment in the show notes. Just go to dogcast.com slash episode 41. Or unusual venues. I'd love to see unusual venues that you can post for us. Absolutely. Leave that in the comments as well. Love to see more of that. Play to Sears parking lot. Woo! Hey, yeah. We did that with uh, Jonathan Ferguson. Yeah. A few times, in fact. And it was also paid pretty well. Yeah. You'd be amazed what you can find in this city. Another interesting thing, it is a bit of a tangent, but Bob Baker, who's been in music marketing for since 1995, I believe. Wow. So he was doing kind of mailing list newsletters, e-newsletters before most people had even thought about marketing mm-hmm. that way. And he's sort of gone and started a venture uh, with creative entrepreneurship. So he has a website and a podcast and a blog where basically he's interviewing people who make a living doing what they love to do, whether that's art or music. He's actually only interviewed a, a number of musicians. It's mostly been, you know, authors or other types of, of creative entrepreneurs. But I thought that was really cool. And it happened right around the time I was looking into this, starting this new niche of, of music marketing or niche. <laughs> <laughs> and for, you know niche for our american audience and uh so you can find that at diycareermanifesto.com and of course it's bob baker so uh, with music marketing stuff you'll often find him at the top of the google search results he clearly knows what he's talking about in this area so definitely worth worth checking out and that's some, one of the things i've been listening to but you touched on video games that kind of dovetails nicely into what I wanted to talk about with Tommy Tallarico's Art in Disguise, the TED Talk that he did about video games. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Wait, wait, back the truck up. Tommy (laughs) Tallarico? Okay, and what a lot of people, I probably mentioned, because I babble about this, because it's such a fun experience, and it was cool to be a classical musician being treated like a rock star. Yes. I have done video games live twice or three times. I've done it a bit. 
It's a good time. One of my it's favorite so concerts. Cool. Um, you know, getting to do Lord of the Rings music, fun. Getting to do video games live, funner. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Tommy Tellerico <laughs> and Jack Wall are awesome. It's cool to get to work with them. Um, There's an interview of him. He on did it. You haven't I'm seen good. it? No, I haven't seen it. What? Why have I not come across this? On, I watch Ted all the time. I How you, have I not come across this? I sent you the outline like a week ago, didn't I? No, you didn't send me an outline. What? You said you I'm got it. I'm flying at the seat of my pants. I got something else. Oh, God. From okay. you. It was an Evernote thing, so maybe if you're not used to using Evernote, it's... I did not get this outline. There's a Tommy Tellerico. We need to pause the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> And, and watch it. Yeah. I think it's a pretty quick one, actually, so that'll work. Pause. All right, so we just watched Tommy Tallarico's TED Talk. What did you think? I, I liked it. I'm also still not a fan of my cell phone because I keep losing emails off it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and I would have loved to watch that sooner because uh, a lot of that I've heard before uh, live at Video Games Live. He says things like that. He's like, oh, people say video games are blah 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 but if you know it inspired you and caused you to be more artistic cheer and then the, it's deafening and, and, and beautiful and and it really is it's cool to see the costume competitions and yeah you know it's one thing to see pictures of cosplay it's another thing to be in a room with somebody and see Definitely. the individual detail no no this person went and actually put like Tolkien on the hem of their dress uh Elvish is Elvish the correct term on the hem of their dress to have it, you know, more or, or the, that was a wizard, so that was a dude <laughs> <laughs> to be more accurate or, or things like that. And it's nothing you'll ever see in a photo, no. but you get up close with some of these things, and it's just unbelievable the cosplay that people put into it, or or being a musician and having people like in the middle of a piano concerto for Final Fantasy VII that somebody was playing, somebody just stands up on their chair and on their seat in an orchestra setting and goes, woo! You know, that does not happen to us often as, no. as classical musicians. So it's really cool to be a part of it. And you kind of get to feel like a rock star for a day. <laughs> <laughs> so I loved always, uh, always doing that. But I also really felt... Um, at the beginning when I first heard and, and was participating, I really felt that this was the future of bringing mm. classical music to young yeah. people. And really something he said in the TED Talk there, too. And I think that's why there's more orchestras also doing things like, you know, uh, Lord of the Rings, playing the actual film while playing the music, or, uh, you know, pops. You know, musicians always complain about pops. I don't know why. But, you know, doing pops, um, it brings people in. Doing movie music brings people in, but nothing quite like the video game thing. You know, people start having difficulties getting tickets as soon as they release them with those. Wow. Yeah. That's kind of wild. Oh, we're going to add another show. Do you think you guys can squeeze one in your schedule? Oh, yeah, sure. For something like that. It's, it's really awesome. It's interesting because, you know, you get certain musicians going into it. Oh, I, I, don't, I don't know. We're just playing video game music. Like, beep. Beep, beep, beep. I can't really sing the song because I think that's an iPod thing. But, but the chip tunes kind of. But stuff. they're like, oh, there's four notes in this song. This is gonna suck. And then they get into it and they're like, oh, this is kind of good music. And they're like, but still. And then they see young people really engaging with classical music and their attitudes really change. And yeah. I'm not saying that musicians have bad attitudes in general, but it is easy to to stop and go. We're gonna play video game music. Ooh. Ooh, I feel so pro now. But when you actually look at the breadth and the depth of music in video games, it is professional, it is top-notch, and it is incredible. Yeah. I think part of the whole controversy thing, it's it's probably one part marketing on mm. the part of, of Tommy Tallarico, but the other part is that I think he needs to be prepared for criticism because it always seems to crop up, and I don't know where these yeah. people are coming from. Yeah. And I even saw it when I went to VGL that one time. So, oh, were there protesters? The, I wouldn't say protesters. I go in the back door, so I don't see this. There were a couple of uh, adults watching kids play Ratchet and Clank, and they were commenting on, "What is this video game thing? And it's so terrible! And why are kids wasting time?" And yada yada yada. Well, guess what? Anybody who has uh, 
played video games is totally knows exactly what they're going to. But why do kids? Who, why do kids waste time playing with model dinosaurs? Why do kids waste time making volcanoes? Because that doesn't tell anybody anything. Because it's just baking soda and vinegar. But it gets your imagination going. You get that kid's imagination going, and things are gonna happen. Exactly. We have to be careful with that because we're trying to foster individual creativity. But somewhere along the line, we think, oh, no, we have to make sure they go to college and university and make sure they get the right education, which in some cases is necessary. Yes, for some career paths. However, not to the detriment of killing individual creativity. That and, you is know, a huge issue. It's interesting, too, because there's more and more colleges and universities that are require you to be... Um, what's the term liberal arts colleges or or whatever where they require you to be um multifaceted as a human being you know i wanted to go to school for opera really would love to still be able to afford to go to school for opera if if somebody would like to hand me the money i would probably kiss you uh in front of my fiance (laughs) (laughs) he's in the room so (laughs) saying things that he would hear I would be thrilled to get such a opportunity to go study music full time, um, mm. regardless of the fact that I'm totally. learning dis- disabled. I would probably cry my eyes out if somebody gave me that opportunity. Mm. And I remember looking at the programs and they're like, yeah, you have to take science and math. And I'm like, but I'm here to take arts. Yeah, but you need to be a whole person, just like anybody who's studying science or math at our university is required to take arts courses. Yeah. You need to be a whole person. You know, how are you supposed to come up with creative answers to science if you do not look at it with a different eye? One of my... Yeah. Here comes the geek. Geek (laughs) moment number two. (laughs) Ding! Um, Anna has an award uh, from one of the Science Olympics for having the most creative eye. It was an award created based on something that I did to solve a problem that uh, was a way of solving it and it solved it and they'd never seen anybody think of a way to do that before if you do not have creativity you can be all analytical as you want but there still needs to be a new way to attack it einstein even talked about there needing to be beauty in math and Mm. physics you know if you really listen to people who are higher in the field of math and science they have to look at things creatively. They have to try to solve problems new ways. You cannot kill creativity in a child and expect them to be a fully functioning human being or adult. That's sort of like with Steve Jobs being fascinated by fonts and yeah. how lettering works. You know, I, I, fonts might not be my thing. I do spend quite a bit of time on fonts, like, I guess, because I'm artistic. Yeah. I, I don't know if I'd want to sit around and create fonts. It would probably be no. like watching paint dry for me. Might be fun to do some calligraphy or... But the people who do it, though, really do enrich my life. Yeah. As, as, as silly and as ridiculous as it sounds, you know, I've, I've loved to sit and create letterhead when I was younger for different <laughs> things. I'm well, creative. Yeah. Or um, when I'm doing a, a headshot for, for modeling or acting, I want to come up with, you know, oh, this is the font that I think... Um, represents me in this field the best it's different for for modeling and acting right yeah you know and that's changed over time when i was younger you'd use kind of a not quite comic sans kids kind of i'm cool kind of font and it worked and it got me work and now i would never dream of that but it's you, true you use something appropriate so yeah what i'm saying it enriches my life i'm not sitting here going oh, it's not a throwaway comment. I'm being genuine. And you know that and you know me, but people listening may think I'm a little crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy, good, fun times, Anna. And and, and uh, that seems a little weird, but, you know, I, I can sit here and I'm, I'm looking at, we've got games up on the shelf and, you know, the font for Munchkin Quest just really kind of gets you going or yeah. apples to apples even or skip bow and Jenga. It sets a mood. It's true. It really does. Yeah. Tangent. <laughs> your your fifty fifth tangent of the day, ding. <laughs> but part of what Tommy says about you know violence and co- the correlation of video games, it, it's it's a little sketchy. It is a sketchy thing to say, and and as a woman, I have some really um, strong opinions. Yeah, I'm allowed to have some strong opinions. Violence against women in our culture is um, pretty rampant, and by making certain things okay 
how do I say this without sounding like I'm being sexist towards men? Because I'm not. Because I think that um, certain attitudes are bad for men and they're bad for women because it doesn't allow, you know, when we think some of these things, they call it rape culture, you know, that's when male massage therapists have to apologize a hundred times for touching your neck, you know, I'm about to touch your neck now. You're like, dude, this is a massage. Just do it. You know, like, I know you're going to touch me because it's your job, (laughs) you know, or male nurses shouldn't feel weird about being male nurses or worry that somebody will think that, you know, a male nurse is going to rape them. When we have this attitude, it's bad for men and women. Yeah. And violence against women is bad for men as it is for women. Because there's so many things I can get into, and I'm not going to because it's not a thing. But it is something that is a problem in the video game industry. You know, random sexual harassment when you're cosplaying at a, com- at a con. Right. Yeah. Um, something I've experienced and is sucks you know your hand does not belong on my body without my permission even if you're my partner you know it's a discussion my partner and i do have and i trust him and you know i'm, I'm lucky we have an open communicative uh, relationship where we can discuss these things you know if i go to a con or if i'm at a video game thing i'm less likely to dress up than i was five years ago because i've experienced so much sexual harassment and you could call it assault you know, when somebody gropes you. Right. Um, not appropriate to have those comments about my body. Not appropriate to have your hands on my body. Ever. You know? Um, you want to pose for a photo with me? It is not appropriate to grab my boobs or my butt in the process. Yeah. On any level. You know, it's not okay to come up and photograph my cleavage or my butt. Um, these are problems in the video game. Um, industry and you can sit and (laughs) say oh you're too feminist or whatever but it is an issue you know there are girls who pretend to be men when they're playing games and find they're being treated completely different it's something that keeps coming up in social media is guys who are going I didn't think it was that bad until I pretended to be a woman and then it was like holy shit Mm. you know I'm not saying every guy out there is like this but it is something that deters a lot of women I know Um, and we discuss it (laughs) so um but we're afraid to talk about it with the men in our lives because they're like i'm not like that or the guys i know aren't like that and we play great with this gal well that's you guys but it is something that needs to be checked in the in the industry and spoken about female programmers um are often made to feel pretty horrible there's been some pretty high profile incidents that uh, recently come up at some conventions I think you I don't know if you've heard of them hmm. um, these things don't need to happen and we need to check these things because you're alienating a very large part of your market you know there are women who love video games love to play oh, yeah. them who are turned off but you could also draw in so many more women not by going oh i want to do a video game for women let's do something about shopping and lipstick yay that's not going to bring us in because it's going to make me feel like you really don't understand me let me be part of the game let me you know feel comfortable playing it yeah um let me play a man or a woman character like who cares but by checking those things you could have so many more people investing in and interested in the market for sure that's i'm going to shut up now <laughs> <laughs> sorry there's a lot i could say and and it's upsetting and, and there's a lot i could say about that in music too and we're going to discuss that later <laughs> yeah i think you know to respond to that a little bit i think men have lost their fight whenever i think of these issues i always think of john eldridge and some of the material he's created with ransom heart ministries you may like it you may not and that's okay but i guess i always kind of base it on that foundation when i when i think of gender issues because with men losing their fight really that is one of their core desires if when everything is so accessible and findable and searchable online that they no longer desire to fight for the affection and love of a woman, it really turns ugly in some of the ways that you're describing, I think. There's a fantastic video. Um, I'm going to search it here. It's on Upworthy right now about, um, and I'll send you the link, 
for the podcast, objectifying women and uh, right. talking about how everyone loses. And there's some cool documentaries I've seen. America the Beautiful. Um, the one guy talks about, and this is a greater so- society issue. It's not just video games, but it is. It can be very bad, and it's. You know, you just lost half your market. Like, yeah, for look sure. at it, right? We're talking about marketing and entrepreneurship. You want to make these people feel welcome. And there's some cons that are doing an amazing job of, like, trying to take care of harassment. And if they hear about it, people are being escorted out. And that's really amazing. But keep in mind that when something like this happens, you can feel like it's your fault a little bit. And you can feel frightened I'm a gal with martial arts I'm a gal who's pretty strong and independent it can make you feel hmm, dirty and wrong and like it's your own fault right oh I dressed up like my favorite character from such and such or I gr- dressed up like this kind of character maybe I brought it on myself didn't ask you to touch me because I wanted to play that. Or you get called, you you either get told, oh, that's awesome, you dressed up like blah, 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 from blah. And uh, I love, honestly, posing for pictures with female um, fans f- because they're so much more stoked about it. But then you get the, oh, you're such a slut, or you get the, oh, you're, hmm. you know what I mean? Like, it's such a catch-22. Either I'm... I'm too ugly or unattractive to dress like this video game character because I'm I'm too fat or whatever or I'm too awesome or I'm too much of a slut like what is it do you know what I mean like it's very confusing and it doesn't make you feel good yeah. um and it's it's it makes it harder to report so it's great for the guys who are there. And there are guys who are like, hey, that's not appropriate. And I've seen interactions where guys like stood up and said, yo, it's not cool to like talk to her about her boobs because she's at a comic con. Yeah. Cosplay is not consent is the campaign that's been around. Um, and then I'm just trying to pull up another video to link to about um, sexualization of women and objectification of women um but we can go on and then i'll send you the link sure yeah it's a it's a confusing issue to be sure it is and it's it it closely links with violence and it's something that needs to be looked at in video games and i'm not saying you need to like have fat characters or whatever like i love curves on comics and 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 video games like we were talking about wonder woman earlier oh my god she's got these beautiful thick thighs and like (laughs) strong well she has to she's got legs that can jump over tall buildings right? right like she's got some muscle to her and oh my gosh, like, I wanted to be like her when I grew up. You know, she's got big legs and she's got strong arms. And she's like, she's a tough chick, right? Yeah. Um, so I am not saying you need to make, you know, video game characters look like me, but I'm saying, you know, don't judge a gal for dressing up like the video game heroes, no. right? Because... We don't really have a choice. <laughs> you know, there's more choice in costume for guys. I saw a cool meme the other day. It was, uh, what if superheroes dress, male superheroes dress like female superheroes and they're all standing there in banana hammocks with capes. <laughs> and it's it's funny, right? Yeah. But that's what you're doing to us. Definitely. I think what I wanted to say, too, about kind of the creative aspect, and I fundamentally agree with Tommy that video games can inspire kind of that creative part of your mind they're amazing they're really incredible it doesn't merely just kind of deaden your senses that was not my experience growing up at any rate Uh, things may have changed a little bit with kind of photorealistic 3d games and so forth right Um, and they and they're and and yeah i mean there are studies about that and they do use that to desensitize troops who are going to war and stuff mm. um interesting uh, i mean I think it's a little different when you're training a troop and the mentality of, of, of a guy who's training to go into war. We know there's a lot of problems there, right? We've had a lot of suicides in our military here in Canada recently. I don't know how it's going in the States for that. I don't know if it's reported. Yeah. But I think the mindset of that is different than somebody who's sitting down to play Grand Theft Auto. Yeah. 
you know? Exactly. But what I wanted to say about that, too, is, you know, we have to think about artistic expression as well. Mm -hmm. Is it merely about copying what other people have done and improving on it? Which some people have obviously created Halo art that's better than the box art or some of the original company's art, and that's to be commended. However, uh, isn't the ultimate goal to kind of find your own style, find your own niche, yeah, do it. Self-expression yeah. to, is is important too. I'm not, I think both sides are are valuable. I would never tell somebody who did fan art that they were contributing. That's not what I'm saying. But I think if you want to do something uh, beyond like doing commissions for your friends, you may want to begin creating something that uh, personal as well. Oh yeah. Same with music. Same with. But it's great that it can inspire art. you. Like I've heard exactly. songs that have made me want to go and do, make a film. Now that I'm kind of involved in filmmaking a little bit, um, I've heard songs that have made me go, "Okay, I want to do a film." Because I don't know about you, and I know there's other musicians like myself. Um, if you play me a song, I can sit and tell you everything I'm seeing in my head. And sometimes I can hear the same song twice and see a totally different s- scene. Hmm. But like. I can tell you what I'm seeing. Yeah. And that can trigger stories for me. Even if there's no story in the music. Or I can hear a song with a story and go, oh, I want to know the rest of the story. Oh, okay, I'll just write it. So it can trigger you in your own creative process. It doesn't have to be about creating within that fan yeah. fan art world, right? I think, yeah, on a most basic level, I agree. It, it fosters creativity, and we do need that. And it's an industry where that creativity can still be rewarded monetarily. So in that sense, it's good. You've been listening to the David Andrew Weeb Interviews and Music Business Podcast, broadcasting from Calgary, Alberta, Canada. This has been a Red Flame production. To learn more about Red Flame, go to redflamerecords.com.